Thank you, Fabrizio, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Let me see if I can make it work, this. OK. So I'd like to start right off at the beginning by acknowledging uh, my colleagues in FAO West Bank and Gaza Strip, as well as the, the veterinary services in Palestine that we, that we worked with. And this is the team uh, that, really, that really did this work and, and put it together. So you're, I believe, all familiar with the global FMD control strategy that was adopted in 2012. And it has three components to it. Uh, the first one being the control of FMD, and the PCP is used as the main tool for that. The second is about strengthening the veterinary services, and we have the PVS tool for that. Uh, but the third one is the control of other infectious diseases simultaneously. And there's no tool to go along with that. So what I'm presenting to you today is an approach that we took to tackle this third component. A little bit of background and where we're working. Um, you can see that it's a similar area to the other presentations, well, to at least the first presentation from Case this morning. Jordan's here. West Bank and Gaza Strip are here. Um, livestock are an important uh, part of the Palestinian culture and heritage, and they actually developed a sector strategy for livestock in 2015. They have a number of significant transboundary animal diseases as well as zoonoses, um, including foot and mouth disease, PPR, brucellosis. Um, and between 2014 and 2016, EU FMD um, and FAO supported the Palestinian vet services to develop an RBSP for FMD control. And I was fortunate to be part of that work along with uh, Chris Bartels and, and Case. And then in 2015, the FAO approached um, Chris and myself to, to take the same um, approach to develop an RBSP for multiple zoonotic diseases. So we were really, really happy to accept that challenge. And these are the methods that we, that we used. Uh, we first of all, on, we had a course of seven missions. And we arrived in the first mission with a plan to prioritize which zoonoses should be included. Uh, we would allocate two to three people to each disease out of the team that we were uh, given to work with. Uh, Cross pinning it all, we would have some training and capacity building on uh, surveillance, epidemiology, and risk analysis. And finally, at the end, um, and throughout as much as possible, meet with stakeholders to disseminate those results. We plan to use, or we did use, um, an adapted version of the template of the risk based strategic plan that was developed for FMD control. Um, and we developed, rather than five different um, strategies, we developed one strategy with uh, six chapters. So we had an overarching chapter and then five different disease-specific chapters. So we didn't develop five strategies, but, uh, but really just one. So that's why we're calling it integrated. And within each one of these disease-specific chapters and the overarching chapter, it, it consisted of a situation analysis, the strategy itself, and then a plan for monitoring of both implementation of the activities and the impact that they were having. Each strategy had three areas of focus, uh, one on surveillance, the second on prevention, because it's uh, usually more effective to prevent outbreaks from occurring in the first place, and finally on response, so when outbreaks are detected, what is the most effective response? So like I said, we arrived in the country with a plan for uh, prioritization, and this is what we, the approach that we took. We, um, we identified uh, together with the team in a participatory way, the different reasons to control disease, different categories of reasons. So for animal health, to improve or protect human health, uh, trade opportunities, because there was a legal obligation to do it, uh, maybe, Capacity is not really a reason, but it's more of a likelihood of success or feasibility of controlling that disease. And then the perceptions by society, how important are those diseases to control. And within each of those categories, we identified a number of indicators to consider um, on that prioritization. 
And so each, under each category, the diseases, uh, 100 points were divided up um, between each disease according to their importance on that category. And then the categories were also weighted. And here's our results. Um, and the first thing you might notice is that these aren't all zoonoses because when we arrived uh, for the first mission, it had already changed scope from uh, zoonotic disease to high impact disease. Um, but we did the exercise uh, as planned anyway, and some of the most important diseases were seen as brucellosis, uh, PPR, and chlamydia. Um, and then these are the diseases that we were selected to work with. So they're a bit different than the priorities that the team uh, found, but these were the priorities of the chief veterinary officer. So these are our five diseases moving forwards. The situation analysis was our, our next step in the results. And in that, for each disease, we looked at what is the agent and mode of transmission, what is the current status of that disease or what's known about it um, in, the, in the area, what control is currently done, and what is the international standard, what should be done. And finally, what are the hot spots or gaps or areas for improvement? And we found when we're looking at our different diseases that there were some commonalities, like we had two vector-borne diseases, others um, spread more by direct contact, some were endemic, some were considered sporadic or emerging, uh, a lot of overlap in terms of different tools to control the diseases, and also uh, themes of gaps uh, needed in order to, to address the disease, significant needs across the board for raising awareness, um, for improving the flow of information and reporting, uh, and that was common to all the diseases. And then the next step was to formulate strategic objectives, and again there was an overarching strategic objective uh, as well as disease-specific ones. And again, themes emerged. Um, reducing impact was common to all the diseases. Uh, understanding the epidemiology and impact, so sometimes uh, there were significant gaps in understanding, and that was also quite common. And then for a couple of diseases, um, with PPR and lumpy skin disease, there was really a, a drive to that freedom was achievable uh, in the case of PPR, and that was their, their goal along the, along the PPR pathway or to maintain freedom, because there had been an incursion of LSD, and it was believed that it was uh, no longer there. So the next level is the component objectives. Um, so we have a lot of different uh, terms that we use, but component objectives are a little bit more tangible, um, how we would achieve the strategic objective. And so again, we defined component objectives on the themes of surveillance, prevention, and response. But we didn't tailor them to specific diseases or risk hotspots. So this was a difference uh, than the approach we've taken in foot and mouth disease, where we really tailor these um, to, the, to the risks. But here, rather than um, making specific component objectives, we thought that these were appropriate across the board. And then the tactics and activities were uh, defined according to each disease, as well as overarching. So overarching, uh, one of the main themes that we identified was that the, the Palestinian vet services hadn't identified what diseases are priority diseases, and so they were trying to control everything equally. All of the OIE listed diseases, and there's several hundred, they, um, they were working to control them. And then improving surveillance, raising awareness, as well as disease-specific issues. The monitoring um, is the last, the last uh, component of the plans. And we did this in the form of, uh, for implementation, we defined concrete tasks that could be um, itemized, if you want. And, and then basically this is like a checklist. So ideally they would put in a target date for when they wanted to complete, for example, a list of reportable and notifiable diseases. Uh, disease fact sheets are created, tick, tick, tick. 
The impact, on the other hand, is are all of these activities having the desired effect? So through doing these activities, do you have more timely reporting? Uh, is information flowing better? Is there better compliance with procedures? So this is more of a log frame type monitoring approach. Um, we found that we liked this approach a lot. It was a really nice project. Um, the feedback from the FAO as well as the veterinary services was they felt like this really enhanced their capacity to do risk-based, um, science-based planning and that they felt they took ownership on the strategies. So you can see here's our team in the final workshop, each one with a disease and presenting those strategies to their stakeholders. Um, there was a feeling that in the future the prioritization exercise was valuable and uh, they would like to see that followed. That although gathering information can be part of the strategy, sometimes there's just not even enough information to make a useful strategy. So that should be also be a part of it. Language is always a challenge and they thought that it was better to translate the overarching chapter first before going on with the other ones. Um, and then need to put it into operation to keep the momentum going quickly. So this project ended with the strategy um, and there's been a bit of a gap going to operations, I guess. So this is my last slide. Um, we, would, we found this a really good experience and believe that the, there's a value to integrating strategy development uh, for progressive disease control that it allows for a more effective use of resources because you're also integrating uh, the resource allocation and considering where resources should be used. And we also found that these vets were really happy to talk to us about all the diseases that are crossing their, their desk and not just FMD. So thank you very much.